Welcome to the Humanize podcast, all about personalizing your health. I'm your host, Rebecca Kelly, and today our topic will be how to heal from mold illness with functional medicine consultant, Brendan Vermeer. Um, a little bit about Brendan, um, uh, but before I introduce him, I want to remind everyone to subscribe and get all the other variety of casts and audio, video, and transcription at humanizehealth.com. Also, I want to send out a thank you to our lead sponsor, Village Green Apothecary, and please go visit them at myvillagegreen.com. So um, let me go ahead and share with you. Brendan is a functional medicine consultant, clinical researcher, board-certified holistic health practitioner, master nutrition coach, master personal trainer, USAW sports performance coach, and CrossFit certified trainer. Brendan is regarded as one of the top leading experts in metabolic health and holistic education. He is the proud owner of the Metabolic Solutions Institute, dedicated to educating health professionals and clinicians with cutting edge strategies to best serve their clients and their patients. So Brendan, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Rebecca. It's always a pleasure. Always so much fun. Um, and it's very impressive, all your list of, and I, I heard you're the, also writing a book. Is that true? Right yeah, it's, it's in the works. I'm hoping to get started on that. <laughs> you know, oh, sometime soon. We'll have yeah. to have you back when that comes out and talk yeah, about it. That might be great. a minute, but we'll get it there. Well, um, so we're here to hear what you can share about um, mold, which is something that's definitely impacting a lot of individuals' health. And uh, you're going to talk about that and explain um, what's happening and how does it impact, I think, one of the, the effects I've heard a lot of is actually mental health and mental wellness too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge, huge issue that I think is gaining a lot of traction and in, in awareness currently. And, you know, the, those of us in the mold space, we kind of joke about it's like the mold rush, you know, where everybody's sort of rushing to figure out this mold thing. So there is some degree of awareness and a little bit of sensationalism. So it's kind of blowing up right now, but it is still a huge issue. I mean, the majority of homes and buildings in America and probably the rest of the world are water damaged and probably do have some degree of elevated mycotoxins and VOCs and lipopolysaccharide. And it's an air quality issue primarily that then could potentially cause kind of that sick building syndrome or SIRS or mycotoxicosis, some, some form of mold illness. So there's this huge conversation to unpack around the various ways that mold through environmental exposure or our own internal microbiome and a microbiome dysbiosis can then lead to some sort of um, illness manifestation. So you said it's kind of blown up. So I'm, I mean, in your estimation, then like how common is toxic mold exposure? Uh, extremely common. And it's crazy when you kind of go back through the history where there's references to mold in the Bible, or there was St. Anthony's fire, which was this um, basically an ergot poisoning or a fungal poisoning from the crops over in, I think somewhere in Europe in like the I don't know, 18th century, it was hundreds of years ago, but it really, and, and at a global level, actually, there's a lot of research going into mycotoxin contamination of agricultural goods, primarily grains. So at more of like a global epidemiological level, the primary scientific interest is looking at like Asia and Africa, where there's millions and millions of people that are consuming dangerously high levels of mold toxins through their food because they don't have the same sophisticated, regulated agricultural system that we do in America. And so really it's liver cancer and kidney failure that are the primary things that they're studying. Whereas then in sort of our niche functional medicine industry in America, which is kind of a privileged industry and a privileged good, if we're being honest, now there's this heightened sensationalism of, well, mold is the root cause of all root causes. And so now everybody's running, you know, mycotoxin urinary tests and it's, it's getting a little bit out of control, but, you know, I'm glad to see increased awareness, but we also have to bring some objectivity and be rational with how we're approaching it and qualifying it. Well, you're here to help us with that, right? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? as soon as you find, right. I mean, I notice even with myself, as I find something out, I'll like swing all the way. Like you're, that's all I read about. That's all right. I think about. Right. Until yeah. I kind of put my arms around it and then I kind of might not pay it. Right. You got to find that center part. Yeah. So hopefully you find, help us find that center part today. Hopefully. So how can mold and mold toxins then drive illness? Because you said that there's that, that we were looking at it saying that's kind of becoming the root of illness, right? So what does that, dis how, how does that dysfunction manifest in the body from mold? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we have to obviously keep in mind that humans are a pretty young, immature, naive species that have only been around for, you know, a few hundred thousand years, depending on the chronological timeline you're looking at, whereas fungi and bacteria have been around for hundreds of millions of years. So we have to recognize we evolved with mold and actually emerging research on the human microbiome or the fungal component of the microbiome we're starting to see evidence that suggests that even some of these scary toxin producing molds like aspergillus or penicillium or fusarium or whatever, they seem to be a relatively normal part of the human microbiome. My theory based on the evidence is like, well, I think even some of these scary molds probably play an important role in digestion and gastrointestinal processes, but just like anything else, it's about balance. So if that microbiome is becoming dysbiotic and the mold is overgrowing, just like with candida, you know, we typically think of invasive candidiasis in terms of severe immunosuppression, like HIV or something like that. Whereas now we kind of know it's like, well, even in a more mild, you know, candida overgrowth could then cause like a leaky gut, leaky brain. And so it's the same conversation. It's just now we're talking about mold instead of yeast, you know, candida versus aspergillus, but nonetheless, you know, the mold can really drive leaky gut, leaky brain, systemic inflammation and, and immunosuppression through oxidative stress and mycotoxin poisoning, essentially. So it really is these, these fungal toxins or mycotoxins that drive most of the illness in the body. But again, this is where we have to kind of contextualize because it's like, we all have some degree of mold in our guts already. We all have some degree of mold in all of our environments. But then it becomes this, like, if there's too much toxic mold exposure and not enough immunological metabolic resilience, that's where homeostasis will be disrupted and illness starts setting in. That makes so much sense. Yes, because it, it is in the environment all around us. I remember I was raking leaves one fall and it's like they're all covered in mold already. Right. So there's no way I'm not breathing that right as I'm raking. Yeah. It's and that's just one, you know, then I'm doing dishes and I realize, oh, my wood spoon's got some like the, it's kind of everywhere. Right. Yeah. So what signs and symptoms might be suggestive of mold illness? Like what what are the things that we know and we can say, hey, am I being exposed to mold in my environment? Yeah, the, that's probably the trickiest part with mold is it's kind of the great mimicker, just like Lyme disease, where it can manifest in just about any sort of system of the body. It could be IBS could be mold driven and it could be your brain fog and anxiety and depression. It could be the joint pain and the fibromyalgia. It's a big contributor to autism. So that's where, you know, typically with some of the more severe symptom clusters, like I would say brain fog is probably the most common symptom the musculoskeletal pain and peripheral neuropathy. And yeah, you probably have some degree of depression, fatigue, insomnia, which is all very much neuroinflammatory driven. So it's almost ambiguous and, and nebulous with, we can't really draw like, well, this symptom, that mold particularly, but the more severely ill somebody is, we have to be doing that thorough intake of asking about their environment and assessing their gut health. But anybody that, you know, has, any evidence of water damage to their home or where they're spending their time or a lot of gut brain axis symptomology, kind of the IBS and cognitive psychiatric stuff. I do think it's worth looking into the mold aspect or starting to at least ask some of those questions about mold and mold exposure. So it's, I'm probably not being very PC to use this word, but I'm not crazy. I just have mold, right? I mean, you could literally say that maybe. <laughs> Yeah. You yeah. know, because the symptoms you're describing sound very much like a little bit of depression and, you know, like, you know, things even just from being quarantined for so long, right? Some of us were experiencing some of the things, you know, you start getting, you're, you're in a small space, you can, so it can start sounding like so many different things. Is there anything that like rises the, to the top other than maybe you're just not getting better or like what, what would like, and, and if you start noticing you have this, like, how do you get diagnosed with it? And then like, you know, what are your strategies in for healing yourself? Right. Like, how do you, those, like, how do we put those things together? Yeah. I mean, it becomes a really big conversation. And part of the problem is conventional medicine is just not anywhere near getting to the point where they're getting behind this mold illness concept, right? Like, you know, they are astute to the idea of like an invasive aspergillosis of the lungs, which is usually what kills people with cystic fibrosis, where, you know, these people, because of the genetic disease, they can't clear out their lungs. So they get recurrent fungal and bacterial infections. Um, you know, 
or invasive candidiasis, but conventional medicine is, is not really a lot of help right now with the mold illness conversation, you know, fungal infection, sure, but they don't really have a good grasp on the human microbiome or how microbiome issues play into IBS or IBD. That's just not the way that they work. If you mention mold at all to a conventional doctor, they'll maybe do like a mold allergy test, like IgE, right. but that's not the same thing. Cause with mold, there's all these different types of mold illness, right? There's more of just a uh, fungal dysbiosis in the gut, or we might call that CFO or just microbiome dysbiosis or mold colonization or whatever. Then there's the more mycotoxicosis, which is referring to the buildup of mycotoxins in the body that's poisoning the body from the inside out. Then there's more the chronic inflammatory response syndrome or CIRS, which is really a pseudo diagnosis that's kind of paralleling basically sepsis or SIRS, SIRS, which is an ICD-10 diagnosis. So it's all these like pseudo diagnoses that make it really ambiguous. And then of course, with the majority of homes being water damaged, that's where we need a lot more research at the epidemiological level, because it's like, well, I would bet that if we did, you know, like urinary mycotoxin testing on everybody in the country, pretty much everybody's going to have some degree of mycotoxins coming out of their body, just like life is safe. So this is where I think the conversation has to shift into, well, how do we develop resilience against mold, which it's the same conversation as like COVID where you can't avoid COVID forever. Like you know, right, right. it's not about avoidance. It's, it's about cultivating resilience and, right. you know, achieving, achieving that immunological resilience to the mold or glyphosate or whatever it is. So that your body can fight it off and heal. Yeah. heal. But I would yeah. assume too, part of it is identifying, like you said, if you have damage in your home, right? Yeah. You're going to have to remediate that because as long as there's that in your environment, you're going to continue to be affecting yourself. Right. So you kind of Absolutely. have to look at your environment where your exposure I'm thinking, right. As you're describing this and then figure out then from there, where do you go? What, like if someone wanted to find out more about this, obviously they could visit your website. Right. Yeah. But you know, like when you said most doctors, is that like you're looking for someone who's functional medicine oriented? Like, how is it like if someone's trying to personalize their, you know, because this is what this is at, r- about, right? Personalized health. If someone says, wow, I think I, you know, Brendan, the way Brendan's talking, I kind of think that might be my situation. Like, w- what would they start? Would they Google mold and functional medicine or how how would they figure that out? Yeah, the mold space isn't huge. Uh, I'm pretty well established in that space. And it's, I feel like there's a small handful of us that, you know, are, and it's exploding right now. But that's the thing is I'm seeing all these people running wild with mycotoxin testing. I don't think they're approaching it super well and mm-hmm. almost seems to be creating more problems than solving. So I have a lot of great, you know, free mold resources and stuff that at least like can be a starting point for people and awesome. probably empower people to, you know, take and they can go to your steps. website for this. So oh, that's of course. metabolic yeah. solutions, LLC.com. That's where yeah. we're going to send them. Okay. Sure. And I'll repeat that afterwards, but just uh, a great place to, you know, get started. Um, and then Rondon, is there anything else you'd want to, you know, suggest for someone because we've got a little couple of minutes free, like, you know, that maybe, you know, how would they get started? Obviously they can, they can look up your resources and what are they going to find when they go there? Yeah. Well, I have a free mold guide. That's probably, you know, around 10 pages or something. It's kind of, honestly, it's a really comprehensive guide because it covers like what testing should be we using to qualify the symptoms that might be characteristic of mold, some foundational strategies. Honestly, if people like really use the information that guide, I don't know that they would really even need a professional, to be honest. It's pretty thorough. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, that's amazing. Okay. Well, thanks, Brendan. Really valuable insights. I'm going to repeat it again. Brendan Remire, and he can be found at www.metabolicsolutionsllc.com. That's spelled M-E-T-A-B-O-L-I-C-S-O-L-U-T-I-O-N-S llc.com. Let me remind you to subscribe and get access to all humanized videos, podcasts, and transcriptions from all of our thought leaders like Brendan on a personalized health at humanizehealth.com. Please come back and see us again. Thanks, Rebecca.